G'day. Well, here it comes, ready or not, Christmas. Can you believe it's less than three weeks away? Decorations adorn our houses and shopping centres and public spaces. The frenzy to get just the right gift has begun. The decisions are being made. What do we eat? Who is hosting? Who's buying what? Who's preparing what? And then, of course, on top of all of that own planning, there are the Christmas functions. It's a frenetic time, isn't it? But in the Christmas calendar, this season is known as Advent. It's from the Latin word coming. And it's a time of expectant waiting and preparation. Expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, but also of his ultimate return. So with all that go is going on in our society, at times it is easy for us to neglect this preparation. So over the next weeks, we will be focusing on the coming of Jesus. We begin today a new series, an Advent series called The Gift for All. Not for a special group, but for all. And from here to Christmas Day, in person on our campuses and online, we are doing five part series gold, frankincense, myrrh, presence, and peace. So much of our consumerist commercial society focuses on that this time of year is the exchange of gifts. We are bombarded with suggestions and recommendations. And of course, there is the inherent plea for us to spend up big. But have you ever stopped to wonder where did this concept of giving gifts at Christmas find its origin? To look into this, will you join with me as we read from Matthew's account of the life of Jesus? And I'm reading from the NIV, Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi, sometimes translated wise men. They came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. So when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ or Messiah was to be born. They replied, in Bethlehem, in Judea. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And they were quoting the prophet Micah. Then Herod called the Magi together in secret and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen rise went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. 
On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So as we begin this journey of unpacking some of these gifts, let's pray. Father, in this season where we prepare ourselves for the coming of your son, Jesus, to celebrating his birth and to looking forward to his ultimate return, May you help us prepare. May you help us focus on the gifts he brings. So be with us now as we open up your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this uh, account starts, uh, it ends in a rather strange place. It ends with this uh, departure of the wise men to their country of origin, by a circuitous route, avoiding Herod. And if you go on and read the story, you'll see the reasons for that. But spoiler alert, the gift giving that we see at Christmas is not actually a part of the birth narrative that we celebrate at Christmas. It's actually tied to some time later. It's likely that the Magi, the wise men, arrived well after Jesus was born. You can see some terminology that changes. You've gone from a baby to a child. You've gone from a manger and a stable to a house and the mother's arms. So those lovely nativity scenes with the shepherds on one side and the Magi on the other, well, they're probably not quite accurate. And, and, and while we're on it, who ever said there were only three wise men? It doesn't say anywhere in scriptures how many there were. Traditionally, we've allocated three because there were three gifts. That's all it is. So the Magi, the wise men, brought their gifts. They brought gifts to this child because they were coming to visit a king. And it was not respectful to turn up to an audience with the king empty-handed. They'd heard that the king of the Jews was to be born and they sought to worship him. And the gifts they brought were not just ordinary gifts, they were gifts appropriate for who the king would be. The gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh for the one who would bring the gifts of peace and his presence. The Magi arrive in Jerusalem and they seek the audience of King Herod. Now King Herod saw himself as king of the Jews. He was the political ruler under occupation of Rome. But this is not the king they seek. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be in the court of King Herod as these wise men turn up and ask Herod the question, where is the king? Where is the one born to be king of the Jews? This, of course, would have gone against everything that Herod believed about himself and, of course, spoke against Herod's line and his continuity of rulership. So there in the presence of King, Henry, of King Herod, they say they want to worship a newborn king. No wonder it raises some questions for Herod. And on the advice of Herod, after he had in turn sought the advice of the chief priests and the teachers of the law, they set off for Bethlehem and they follow the star that they'd been following in their journey. And it leads them to a house. And in that house, there is a child with its mother. The child Jesus with Mary. And what's their initial first response? They bow down and worship. They honour him. They pay homage to him, to this child. And then the first wise man opens his travel bag and he presents a gift of gold to the child. 
On the surface, it seems a very strange Christmas gift or gift full stop to give to a child, doesn't it? Maybe, maybe a, a, a toy carpentry set or, or a new outfit or some other noisy toy would have been more appropriate, but gold? Why would these wise men bring a gift of gold to a child? Over centuries of church history, this question has been debated and the question of the gift of gold has been scrutinised. I wonder, have you ever wondered what, what happened to that gold? Some suggest that it actually enabled the escape of Jesus and his family into Egypt, as you will discover later in the narrative. And that's quite possible, but we don't know. Whatever happened to this gift of gold clearly isn't the important thing. Or we would have been told. It is the giving of the gift that is reporting. It is the giving that matters. Gold. A precious metal. In the time of Jesus' birth, the most precious metal. It's been relegated to third now behind rhodium and platinum. And as a matter of interest, silver has been relegated to ninth. It is a gift of precious metal that only a king can afford to have. And yet it seems out of place in the humble setting of a tradesman and his newborn son. It is a reminder to us that this King Jesus is a king like no other. And perhaps the importance of the gift isn't the gift itself, but rather it's what the gift says about the recipient. It was a prophetic gift, declaring that this child is to be anointed king over Israel. Now, this didn't come out of nowhere. This has a deep, rich history. You see, this moment was foretold by God in words to King David some 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus. And we find it in 2 Samuel. Samuel the prophet is relaying to David these words. The Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, the Lord says, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. A thousand years before the birth, this kingship is predicted. And then it was also spoken of to his mother, to Mary. When the angel came and visited her and explained to her about her unexpected and unique impending pregnancy, the angel said these words, and they're recorded in Luke's account of Jesus' life. The angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. A thousand year span a forewarning that there will be a child whose kingship will be like no other. So the presentation of gold to the child Jesus is a coronation gift for a king. It is easy to miss this aspect of Jesus at Christmas because at Christmas our focus is on the manger, our focus is on the birth narrative. It's on the baby. But you cannot have 
the baby Jesus without King Jesus. You see, our world goes on around us and celebrates the nice story of a child that is born and celebrated. But the world is ignorant of the kingship of Jesus. The celebration stops at the birth narrative. It is crucial that we too, like these wise men, honour him as king, that we enthrone him in our lives, not just giving lip service to the fact that this was a prophecy that was fulfilled or that he claims the title king of the Jews, but rather that like the wise men, we give our very best to this king. We surrender ourselves, our wealth, our possessions, to the one who is king, King Jesus. But it begs the question, doesn't it? What kind of king is he? And why would I give him my allegiance? Now, we could spend years unpacking that and whole series on it, and we've spent some time this year already in this space. But let me try and capture something of why this king is worthy of our allegiance. Firstly, he is king over creation. We see this in his life. He, he stilled storms. He, he calmed the winds. He, he smoothed the seas. He healed physical ailments. He is the king over creation. And in fact, the Apostle Paul goes on and speaks about the fact that creation revolves around this man, Jesus. It was by him and through him and for him that God created all that is. He is king over creation. He's also king over all things spiritual, over all realms. We see this again in his life. He was setting people free from oppression. He was commanding spiritual forces. He is the king over all spiritual realms. He is the Lord of lords and the God of all gods. He's also the king over death. He and he alone has died, been dead for three days, risen from the dead, not to die again. And he continues living to this day. He is a risen king. He is king over death. He is the king of love. When asked what most important commandment was, Jesus responded like this. The most important one is to this, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the Jewish Shema. And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and all with your strength. And he quickly moves on and he says, the second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And we see again this in every attitude and action that Jesus had in his life as he lived as a man amongst creation. In his relationships, in his concern for the marginalised and the disenfranchised, as he reaches out to those who were pushed to the edges of society, as he sought to correct uh, systems and understandings that created divides in people. He is the king of love. He is also the king who is God. He is the king who is God and has come to save, to reconcile us and all things to God. The Apostle Paul writes of this in his letter to the Colossian church. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. 
He is a king who has come to reconcile, to save, to re-establish relationship between humanity and God. And finally, he is the king who has come to serve. He is indeed a king like no other. He humbles himself and he puts others first. He is not looking for all the acclamation. And Paul again to the Philippians, he writes of King Jesus like this. He says, being in very nature God, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself like nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He is a king who comes to serve. This is King Jesus. This is the king that is born in a manger. This is the king that the wise men come and bring their gifts to. He is truly a king like no other king. So how will you respond to this man, Jesus, this Christmas time? Jesus was given gold by a wise man, a gift fit for a king, and a king he is. He is a king who would have your allegiance, not by force though, not at the point of a sword, he would have your allegiance by love. He is a king who invites you to serve him, to give him your everything. But then he's a king who turns around and gives you everything of his kingdom. His grace and mercy and love, justice, compassion, peace. He is a king who knows and understands, who taught and lived about how the world really is. He knows your world, the realities of your life, even when you might be confused about them. He is therefore a king who can be trusted with all that you are and all that you have. Will you trust him? Will you trust him with your pain? Will you trust him with your fears? Will you trust him with your brokenness? Will you trust him with your abundance? Will you trust him with your failures? And with your successes? Will you trust him with your health and well-being? I wonder, will you trust him with your life? This is the king who is born at Christmas time, who will return again, who is the king like no other. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, King Jesus, we pause before you this, today. We pause before you to recognise once again and affirm that you are the King of Kings. We ask you, God, to forgive us for when we have perhaps nudged you off that throne and tried to take it for ourselves, or we've put something else there in your place. Help us as we look forward to your coming. Help us to reflect how we might better allow you to be king in every aspect of our lives. And we ask this because we know it is what you long for, 
And we know deep down that it is what is best for us and for this world. We pray in your great name. Amen.